it sometimes seems that there are two groups of people, scientists and the rest of us. Well, I'm actually a scientist, so I mean the rest of you. Scientists explain how the natural world works, and they will liven up a party occasionally by citing pi to 14 digits. They're deductive and at times irritatingly logical. But these impressive traits aren't limited to us. You can be deductive and irritatingly logical, too. Coming up, our monthly look at critical thinking from Big Picture Science, with tips for thinking like an egghead from some surprising places, Africa's savanna and London's Baker Street. It's Skeptic Check, your inner lab coat. Being a scientist is hard, let me tell you. When I was getting my degree in astronomy, I had to sit through classes on mathematical methods of physics and path integrals in the complex plane. Not that much fun. We learned the pitfalls and the procedures of the scientific method, hypothesis, experiment. And then we would go to endless colloquia so that we could sit through presentations that were about as transparent as plywood. The less comprehensible, apparently, the better. So on this chart here, I've illustrated the lattice Boltzmann simulation of solute transport in heterogeneous porous media. It has conduits to estimate macroscopic continuous time and also random walk model parameters. Any questions? And yet today, well, I may not understand solute transport, but I do understand astronomy, you know, how dark matter shows itself, the formation of planets, the life cycles of stars, maybe even where we might best look for E.T. I'm astronomer Seth Shostak. So quick, what are the life cycles of stars? Well, they begin as a big gas cloud. They condense into a star. They do their shining thing for millions of years, sometimes billions of years, and then they die. <laughs> Those are the scientific terms, huh? Uh, they are. Those are the technical terms. Well, you heard it from the astronomer. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists investigate the origin and nature of life. This is our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science, Skeptic Check. Now, there's this idea that scientists are somehow so much smarter than the rest of us. But scientists have the advantage of being trained in deductive reasoning, and so that's really what sets them apart. And if you can figure out how they think the way they do, well, that can help you with so many things you do. And not just when you're thinking about applying lattice Boltzmann simulations to understand fluid dynamics. Astute reasoning is useful when you're negotiating with a teenager, for example. Dad, yesterday you said that if I clean my room, I could borrow the car. And come on, I totally cleaned it. Also, Ray's parents said they'd buy him a car when he turned 16. I'm already 16 and I don't have a car. Come on, you're getting off easy. Also, I need $50 for jeans and I'm thinking of getting a tattoo of a serpent. And instruction in critical thinking can come from some surprising places, from the African savanna or the streets of 19th century London. It's Skeptic Check, your inner lab coat. Okay, I've got my short list here for what it takes to be a scientist. Insatiable curiosity, cognitive excellence, an intuitive feel for quantum electrodynamics, pens, pocket protectors, and a lab coat. Also, the patience to spend years getting single drops of yeast into these petri dishes. Did you do a lot of that as an astronomer? Uh, not too much. I, I usually put the, the yeast into, into my bread-making machine. I'm amused at its pocket protectors, plural. Did you need one for every shirt? or? Yeah, no, I have more than one shirt, contrary <laughs> to what you may think. <laughs> okay. Well, being a scientist needn't be so hard. Indeed, it wasn't always so, nor should it require a long white smock. Now that is the sound of a scientist, says Louis Liebenberg. If we were to imagine that those walking sounds are that of an African animal tracker, tracking antelope or any number of critters in the desert, there is a lot of rich information that a tracker can deduce solely from the prints left behind. And for that reason, ancient animal trackers of 100,000 years ago may have been the first scientists, says Louis Liebenberg. He's the co-founder and executive director of Cyber Tracker Conservation. CyberTracker is software that his nonprofit has developed to collect large quantities of data about savanna animals and their habitat, 
and that software was put on portable devices and given to African game trackers. The interface was designed for people who cannot read or write so that these African trackers can use it and contribute to scientific research. Louis, when did you first have the idea for Cyber Tracker? I was actually tracking with, with Kalahari hunters who still hunt with bow and arrow. And uh, it occurred to me that they were actually gathering enormously detailed and very complex information based on animal tracks and signs. What, what animals were they tracking? Well, actually a whole range. I mean, obviously the, the large antelope like Kudu, Hemspok, uh, Yelland would be their favorite prey species, but they go right down to small rodents, uh, foxes, genets, cats, tracking lions and so on. So you were, you were tracking in the Kalahari Desert with these trackers, and what occurred to you? I, I was working on this hypothesis that the art of tracking may be the origin of science itself. And if that is the case, then there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to employ traditional trackers to do scientific research and wildlife monitoring. So you're with these trackers and you realize that they're gathering enormous amount of information from these animals, about these animals, just from their tracks. What kind of information were they gathering? And just remember, these are, are tracks and signs which are often very obscure. They're sometimes very faint. You know, they could be windblown. So these are not always very clear footprints, and yet they can tell not only the species, but they can tell if it's male or female. They can tell if, it, if the animal is becoming tired or whether it's limping. They, they can tell whether it's walking, whether it's running or galloping. So you can get a huge amount of behavioral information that are not only species-specific, but in the case of, say, for example, when they're running down a kudu in the persistence hunt, they actually identify the particular individual kudu from its footprints. I can understand how you might be able to deduce that an animal was galloping instead of walking, okay, because that would be the distance between the prints, perhaps. How can you tell if an animal is male or female by the tracks or whether or not it's limping and injured? Well, usually your, your males are usually heavier animals. They're more stocky, so the, particularly the front feet are usually broader than those of the female. So you have to first tell whether it's the front foot or the hind foot and then whether it's male or female. You were testing a hypothesis, and that hypothesis was that animal trackers were the original scientists. And when you say original, we're going back maybe about 100,000 years to when most of humanity were hunter-gatherers. Is that right? Is that what you mean by the original scientists? Yeah, yeah. Uh, essentially, when trackers look at tracks and signs, you can't actually, firstly, you can't see the animal, and you can't see what it was doing. So you have to visualize processes that can't be seen, that are indicated by tracks and signs. So you're making hypothetical causal connections between sometimes very sparse signs, and even sometimes there are gaps in the trail where they go over hard terrain or through thick vegetation, where you interpret the behavior of the animal, then you make predictions as to where the animal was going, and then you go look for animal tracks further ahead where you expect to find them. You're also interpreting the tracks in terms of context of the entire environment. So you know there's a water hole ahead. So you have to, by knowing the animal, you can almost, you can think like the animal and then predict where the animal is going. And how, how are those skills and those abilities like that of a modern-day scientist? Can you compare the two? Because some of it is, you could say, it's just logical thinking. Well, essentially, well, one need to make a distinction between what I call inductive deductive reasoning and hypothetical deductive reasoning. Inductive deductive, that is just making generalizations. You just learn, well, the sun comes up every morning, so it's going to come up tomorrow morning. But that doesn't actually explain why the sun is coming up. Now, an example of hypothetical deductive would be, well, the sun appears to come up every morning because the earth is rotating around its axis. Now, that's a hypothesis, okay? So if you imagine back in the old Greek times, with that hypothesis in mind, a philosopher would be able to make a novel prediction. You would be able to predict that, hey, but maybe if I go to the North Pole, the sun won't come up every morning. In other words, you've now made a novel prediction of something that may not have been seen before, and then you can actually go out and test it. And that is the basis of science, that you yeah, you come yeah. up with a question, you gather some data on it, and you test your hypothesis. Yeah, and important to know that the hypothesis itself is not out there, it's created by the human imagination. In science, say for example, in a, in a theoretical science like physics or in astronomy, you can't actually see particles. You see 
particle tracks, basically. You see signs of particles, and then you create a hypothetical model of what it is that caused these signs, okay? In the same way, animal trackers, they can't actually see the animal, and they can't see what the animal was doing. So they have to create in the imagination a hypothetical reconstruction of what they think the animal was doing that will explain the signs that they are observing. It was when you were with trackers in the Kalahari Desert and you were testing this idea that tracking, animal tracking is the origin of science, or animal trackers were the first scientists, that you had the idea for cyber tracker, which is a bit of software. So how did that idea come about and, and then what happened with that idea? What I thought of basically is that if we could somehow capture the information that these trackers are gathering from animal tracks and signs, it could be of enormous value for scientific research or even for nature conservation. The problem being that your best trackers can't read or write. So what we needed to do is to create a tool that would enable non-literate trackers to record and capture very complex information. So our first prototype was on the old Apple Newton, which had a touchscreen, and we hand-wired it to an old Garmin GPS. And then I basically drew little icons, little black and white pictures of all the species of different behavior of animals and so on and so on. So for each screen, you basically, the tracker simply had to select from a selection of little pictures, which they could identify with. So just by going from one screen to another, they could capture the species, how many animals, what were they doing, were they drinking water, were they feeding, what plant were they feeding on. And then when they save the data, it then automatically takes a GPS. We were able to capture very, very detailed information. Louis, when when you gave these African trackers, these devices that had the cyber tracker software on them, you were giving them to people who were non-literate. They weren't able to read. So how did they react when they had a modern handheld computer? Did they look at it with wonder, or did they adapt to it quickly as the teenager here would? Well, actually, the, the irony is that the trackers adopted the handheld computers long before the scientists did, because there were no innate prejudice or technophobic fear of the technology. They just took it and they just used it. I mean, it was just like water of a duck's back. For them, whether they interpret a visual tracks and signs on the ground or artificial signs on a computer screen is logically equivalent to them. How widespread is CyberTracker software being used? Well, it's difficult for us to get exact numbers. We're just a small non-profit and the software is being downloaded freely. But what we do know, it's been downloaded more than 80,000 times in more than 200 countries worldwide. So it's gone beyond Africa. And with the African trackers, could you give us some examples of how these African trackers are able to provide information that, say, a conservationist or someone who wasn't trained in in tracking would not be able to extract from the environment? I think one stunning example is the project we had in Odzala National Park in the Congo, where they were gathering tracks and signs on everything from small antelope to right through to lowland gorillas and elephants and so on. And then in 2003, when the first Ebola outbreak impacted on that area, they were then able to retrace their steps, do patrols on areas that's been covered before, and comparing the data from before and after the outbreak, Firstly, they could tell the impact of the Ebola on chimpanzees and gorillas. Like the gorillas, about 80% of gorillas were, were killed off by that particular epidemic. But furthermore, from an index of abundance of the tracks of the small dacre and the bush pig, they could see that a drop in numbers indicated that the dacre and bush pig were also being killed by Ebola, which is not known before. And given that the dacre is one of the antelope that hunters live on, that that's a very obvious vector for passing Ebola from wild animals into the human population. And on two instances, we were able to warn health authorities about the Ebola outbreak even before it got into the human populations. So you're doing environmental monitoring with the people who understand their environment intimately. But I wonder, is there any ethical dilemma in using the information that trackers use to map their own knowledge, is there any ethical dilemma with turning that over to outsiders and sort of extracting from Native people 
their wisdom and then giving well, it to another community yeah. to use. Well, 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 generally the advantage of tracking is that if you compare it with, say, traditional knowledge of medicinal plants, where pharmaceutical companies, once they've identified a medicinal plant, they can extract the active component, make a generic drug, and the communities get nothing out of it. But with tracking, you can't actually steal the skill from the individual. So it's, it's generally beneficial to the individual trackers because it's creating jobs and it's providing employment, it's particularly now in times when hunting and gathering is no longer a viable way of subsistence. How is it providing employment? Are they paid for this work? Yeah, yeah. E- even in the central Kalahari, that's been off and on, but they get, say, pay 100 pula per day to go do a track survey. 100 pula? Yeah, that's roughly $10. But in communities where most communities are on the edge of starvation, it's actually quite a lot of money. It sounds like the idea that you had and you've been developing, and one of the reasons you developed CyberTracker is the idea that anyone can contribute to scientific research, no matter what their level of education or, or whether or not they're literate. Yeah, in fact, I mean, this is my central hypothesis it's got two implications. Firstly, that we can actually employ traditional trackers to do science. But furthermore, if scientific reasoning is an innate ability, it also means that citizens themselves can create hypotheses, they can test their theories, they can end up writing scientific papers and publishing them in peer-reviewed journals. And is that the case with these animal trackers, that they're writing up theories and publishing them in journals? Well, in fact, we, we have actually, in 99 we've published, a, it's a small little paper, it wasn't peer-reviewed, but nevertheless, it's co-authored by two non-literate trackers, and myself and Justin Steventon, who developed the software. It's a paper on rhino feeding behavior, and that was published in the journal Pachyderm, that, by the way, challenged an assumption made by a PhD rhino specialist at the time who would only come into the area for 10 days to study rhino feeding behavior. And the tracker challenged that and said, no, but that's nonsense because the rhinos would be feeding on different species of plants in different seasons. And did you show them the paper with with their names listed at yeah. the top there? <laughs> yeah, yeah their, their, their names are listed as co-authors and they, they got the copies of the papers and so on. So... And I mean, I mean, for me, that was a huge breakthrough. I think it's the first academic paper that I can think of that was not only co-authored by non-literate trackers, but where the trackers actually produced the hypothesis and then independently, without supervision, gathered the data to demonstrate the hypothesis. Although if they're illiterate, they can't read the papers, but then they wouldn't be the first ones that were unable to read a, a scientific research paper. But at least we we could show them the graphs and so on, so they and we could explain to them the contents of the paper. And obviously they can see the data themselves on the computer screens, on the maps and so on. Louis Liebenberg, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Louis Liebenberg is co-founder and executive director of CyberTracker Conservation and an associate of human evolutionary biology at Harvard University. We reached him in Cape Town, South Africa. Coming up, he doesn't actually have a degree in science, but Sherlock Holmes still applies logical reasoning to solve difficult cases. What this celebrated Baker Street detective can teach us about thinking like a scientist. Next. It's Skeptic Check from Big Picture Science, your inner lab coat. Okay, in this episode of Skeptic Check, we're talking about how to think like a scientist. And we heard from Louis Liebenberg about how ancient trackers may have been the first to employ the scientific method. But those trackers were tracking animals, and today, animal trackers are still doing that. We have science trackers today who seek other prey, criminals, and we call those trackers detectives. But you have your detectives, and then you have your detectives. And what are you doing with that infernal fiddle? Those flies. I was observing the reaction on the common house fly at the chromatic scale. A brilliant experiment. Yes, it will be. If I can find the note that annoys the house fly, huh? then one need only play that one note and pss, all the house flies disappear. Amazing. No, no, no. Elementary, my dear Watson. 
purely elementary. The most celebrated sleuth of them all, Sherlock Holmes, is freakishly smart and, well, let's face it, can think circles around most of us. He has keen powers of deduction and observation, like a scientist, and uses them to solve complex cases, yet he doesn't actually have a degree in science. Sure, Sherlock has some genetic gifts, but that and a deerstalker cap just aren't enough. He's diligently trained himself how to think. And so for psychologist and journalist Maria Konnikova, the author of Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes, the famous resident of Baker Street is a good example of how anyone can teach their brain to think more critically. And it begins with observing the world more carefully. Elementary, really. Okay, Maria, we've all seen this guy, Sherlock Holmes, in action. He's spooky smart. He has the kind of intelligence I assume you have to be born with. It's not something that we mere mortals could hope to obtain with our own efforts. Well, that was my assumption going into this project, Mastermind, as well. But the more I dug into it, the more I realized that Yes, sure. Holmes is a pretty exceptional guy, and he was probably born smarter than a lot of people. But it's not like he's the smartest guy in the room always. He has formidable opponents. And I started realizing that what he does is actually trained up. He's been practicing these skills, honing them for years and years and years. By the time we meet him, he seems like this absolutely fantastic mastermind. But that took a long, long time to achieve. Now, when you were young, your father would read Sherlock Holmes to you. Do you, do you remember that? Do you remember anything about that? Oh, absolutely. The funny thing is, the memory that stayed with me the most wasn't one of the particularly gruesome or intriguing or mysterious moments. It was instead this rather prosaic encounter between Holmes and Watson when Holmes asks Watson how many steps lead up to 221B Baker Street, which is the flat that they share in London, and Watson doesn't know. And Watson says, well, I have eyes that are just as good as yours, Holmes. I don't understand. And Holmes says, well, that's the difference between us. You only see. I both see and observe. And that just really blew my mind and has stuck with me. And that single sentence was the inspiration for the entire book. Well, indeed. Well, maybe you could elaborate a little bit because this difference between seeing and mm -hmm. and merely observing uh, is, is essential. Now, it isn't just a matter of having counted and then memorized the number, <laughs> the number of steps, right? I mean, there's yes, more to it than uh, that. Yes, unlike my eight-year-old self who thought that it was imperative that from that moment on I memorized the number of stairs everywhere I went, which I diligently tried to do for a few months. That's not actually what Holmes was saying. The number of stairs doesn't matter. What matters is that difference that you've pointed out between seeing and seeing and observing. And what that difference really is, from a psychological standpoint, is the difference between mindlessness and mindfulness. So think about, you know, when you're walking down the street and, you know, you pass stores that you've passed every day, and then I stop you and I say, hey, what's in this display window that you just passed? You have no idea because you weren't really paying attention to anything. You were just kind of in your routine, doing your thing. Maybe you were talking on the phone, maybe you weren't, but you weren't really engaged. Now, imagine that you're being mindful, which means that you're actually in the moment. You're really experiencing it as opposed to just letting it kind of go by without any conscious effort to capture any of it. All right. Well, in addition to paying attention and not just, you know, literally mindlessly going through whatever it is that you're doing there, uh, there's the question of accepting it. I mean, there's, there's the analysis part, not just the observational part. And you write that what's important here is to be skeptical of what you hear and what you see. Mm -hmm. Watson, you know, somebody tells him something and his first inclination is to simply believe it. And that's certainly, I think, uh, most of our attitudes when somebody tells us something. We don't, we don't stop to think that, oh, well, maybe she's being devious mm -hmm. or, right? So there's this skepticism in addition to the observation. Absolutely. That's a really important point because our default mode, the way that we're actually set to be, is to believe everything. Thing. One of my favorite examples of this was thought up by the psychologist Dan Gilbert, and he basically said in order to disbelieve something, you first have to believe it. 
So if I tell you that, hey, there's this pink elephant, just for a split second before you realize what I'm saying, you have to picture that pink elephant. So you believe it, and then you say, wait, 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 pink elephants don't actually exist, so I need to disbelieve it. But that moment of belief is always first. And more often than not, we don't actually do that correction. We don't say it's wrong. We just keep the pink elephant in our minds. And so we'll remember something as true, even if someone had told us it wasn't true. Memory is really, really slippery that way. So what Holmes does is he actually interrogates every single piece of information that's important. Holmes never takes himself at face value either. He questions all of his logical leaps to see if they actually make sense. So the skepticism is really all-encompassing. And it's also essential if you want to think like a scientist, is it not? I mean, scientists are presented with nature, the world, data, whatever, observations. And, uh, you know, there often is an obvious explanation, but sometimes that's not the correct explanation. Absolutely. Well, that's the very foundation of the scientific method. So many things seem to make sense, but until we can prove that they make sense by doing really controlled experiments and being skeptical and really testing the limits of that phenomenon, until we can do that, we can't say that it's true. Now, this idea of questioning everything, I mean, it it, it does sound like, like science, a, a lot like science to me, although Sherlock was not a scientist, right? I mean, he had, no, he had no training in science. In fact, I'm not sure he was even sympathetic to science as we understand it. Well, there is that moment when he says that he doesn't really care if the Earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the Earth or what happens there. So you're right. He doesn't always care about physics. <laughs> and he's not trained as a scientist. But the important thing is that Conan Doyle was. So Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes books, was a doctor. So he trained in medicine at the University of Edinburgh. He was an ophthalmologist. And I actually think that's really important to remember because he brings that scientific rigor that he acquired from his medical training to the writing. And I think that's why Sherlock Holmes has so many of those characteristics that we associate with science. His creator was a scientist. Maria, you write about something called the brain attic. Uh, you know, some part of the brain, some <laughs> theoretical part of the brain where your where your memory is. And it apparently doesn't really work like that, but okay. And Sherlock Holmes stocks it with stuff he's going to use. Uh, how do we choose what to put in our brain attic if we want to be like Sherlock? Well, Sherlock Holmes has a really great analogy of the mind. And the attic really captures the essence of what we know about memory, even while, as you say, it's not exactly accurate. So picture this new house, pristine room. You have all of this space in the attic. So what are you going to do? Well, you can take the Watson approach, which is, oh, I have all the space in the world, so I'm just going to use it up. And so you start saying, oh, this looks interesting, that looks interesting. You're throwing it up there because you have all this space. And before you know it, it's a total jumble. You don't know where anything is, and you've run out of space because everything is just a mess and there are things falling on you as you try to open the door to the attic. And then you have the Sherlock Holmes attic. And that attic means... Okay, I know that I have a finite space, and I want to make sure that what I have in there is both what I want and need, and that I can then access it. Because the thing about our memories, which is what the brain attic is, is that we only really know what we can recall at, at any given moment. It doesn't matter if once upon a time you knew a fact, if when you need it, it's totally gone. So it, it's important not just to store, but to encode properly. So what we need to do to have a Sherlock Holmes attic is to question every item that we're putting in there, to say, okay, you know, do I really want to remember this tidbit about Taylor Swift's new song, or um, am I going to need this scientific discovery fact because this is what I'm writing about? And when you make that sort of judgment call, you're already affecting that memory because the point of encoding, the point when we store a memory, is the point where we have the biggest 
amount of influence over how it's stored. Afterwards, if we didn't store it properly, it's going to be really, really difficult to change that. And then we need to make sure to organize it well. So Holmes' attic has files. The files are labeled. They're cross-referenced. And as far as memory goes, that's the exact right way we want to encode something. We want to think, okay, well, how does this relate to what I already know? Where should I store it? We have to be really mindful about making sure that we know where to look when we need to look for it. Maria Konakova, thank you so very much for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. Maria Konakova is a psychologist, journalist, and the author of Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. And you can read Maria's weekly blog on psychology at thenewyorker.com. Still not convinced that you could think like a scientist or that you'd even want to? After all, why puzzle things out? It's much more fun to jump to conclusions. On Tuesdays, when I drive to work, the lunch special at the cafe is chicken salad. But when I walk to work on Wednesdays, it's lasagna. So they must serve the more fattening food on the days people get more exercise. Totally makes sense. Next, a scientist who wrote How to Teach Quantum Physics to Your Dog now focuses on human ambitions and why being an egghead is fun. It's our monthly look at critical thinking skeptic check, your inner lab coat. Okay, you've always thought it would be really neat to be a scientist. The excitement of being the first to know something. The respect you'll get at parties when people hear you're into 11-dimensional paleo-quantum Riemannian research. And as a scientist, when I examined the data on paleo-quantum Riemannian effects, I found a preponderance That's of the... It's not a real thing. What was that? There's no paleo-quantum anything except as a fad diet, and Riemannian is a form of geometry, so there's no paleo-quantum Riemannian. You made that up to impress people. <laughs> oh, uh, hey, I seem to have finished my diet root beer. Please excuse me while I go refresh my drink. And there's also the oohs and ahs when you don that white lab coat. Hey, so Gerald, before we go, let me slip on my laboratory vestment. <laughs> it's freshly starched, and we will be a hit at the clubs tonight. Ooh, ah, uh, no. But let's face it, despite all these incentives to enter the hallowed halls of research, you're thinking... Well, you're not an animal tracker on the savannah. You're not a consultant for Scotland Yard. So is there any hope for your sciencey self? There is. Physicist and astronomer Chad Orzel, who wrote a book about teaching physics to your dog, actually more than one. More than one dog? More than one book about physics to his dog. He may have more than one dog. He figures that even you, someone who has concluded that scientists have DNA that barely overlaps with your own, can think like a scientist. Chad Orzel is the author of Eureka, Discovering Your Inner Scientist, and he says that it's remarkable that even those people who say that they hate science and they wouldn't be caught dead doing science are often doing science without knowing it. The process you use to solve a crossword puzzle is essentially a scientific process. Right? You look at the clue that you're given, you think about a word that might possibly fit that, you, know, you pencil it in the blank, and then you check to see if it fits with all the, the crossing clues. And if it does, you can have some confidence that, that the answer that you've got is the correct one, even if it's something a, a little weird or, or unusual, like those, those, those theme clues that go all the way across the puzzle and have like a three-word phrase in them. You're not going to guess those right off, but you can piece them together from the, the easier clues that cross them. And that involves essentially scientific reasoning. But the people who are doing the crosswords on the commuter train, I mean, they don't think of themselves as doing science, and it sounds like maybe they should. Do they simply not realize that because they have this idea of what science is and it doesn't comport with what they're doing? I think so. I, I mean, we, we have the, this idea that, that science is this esoteric collection of knowledge that only, you know, certain elite people are able to comprehend. And, you know, there's a sense in which that's, a, that's an artificial distinction that, that goes back millennia. You can look at the Greeks as the people who start making a distinction between, you know, sort of abstract science that, you know, lofty people do and then, then the grubby technology that, that people you know, get their hands dirty making things. 
But you know, really, the the core of all of this is is a very simple reasoning process, and it's something that that absolutely everybody does all the time. Your book, Chad, disabuses us of the idea that. You know, scientists are just naturally super smart, and that's the distinction. I have to say, uh, uh, I'm going to have to take a little bit of umbrage with that idea, but then again, you know, I suppose you would have to as well. might wound your vanity a bit, but you assure the reader that scientists are not much different from normal folks and that everyone has an inner scientist waiting to be revealed and unleashed. Why are you convinced of that? You know, I- Another of the origin points of the book is that when I tell people that I'm a physicist, one of the responses I get is, well, you must be really smart. And, you know, I, I have no idea what to say to that. I mean, there, there are some things that I'm better at doing than, than other people, but it's mostly because I happen to like doing the sorts of things that make a good physicist. In the same way, you know, I don't particularly like doing the things that make a good carpenter. There are mental aspects to carpentry that, that you know, I just can't get. I, someone who's good at it will look at a problem and immediately see a simple and elegant solution that would take me hours of, you know, hitting my thumb with a hammer to, to come around to. Uh, but nobody will go up to a, a carpenter and say, oh, you, know, you must be really smart. So, so we have this, this awkward... You know, it's a compliment, but it's sort of a distancing compliment uh, that that's putting people off as different, and I and I don't think that's really justified. I think that you know we we have this idea of science as a as an unusual pursuit, but when we shouldn't. Really, scientists are are just like other people. They just happen to be interested in other things. One of the people you reference in your book is Charles Darwin. But, you know, as an example, isn't that somewhat of an odd choice? Because, after all, he, his work led to a complete rethinking of the natural world. How is this an example of how anybody can do science? Charles Darwin was not anybody. Well, you know, Charles Darwin di- didn't start off as, you know, Charles Darwin, right? He, he started off as a, a young man with an interest in the natural world and who signed on as the, the naturalist for uh, the Voyage of the Beagle. And while he was doing that, you know, he wasn't thinking about completely reshaping our picture of the natural world. He was just collecting things that looked interesting. The same way that, you know, I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. They have collections of rocks that are, you know, mostly gravel found in the driveway. But there's this this instinct to collect things that, that happen to look interesting. And, and Darwin was just employing that. He collected vast numbers of samples of things on his South American trip. And then when he returned to England, he spent years breeding pigeons and plants and and looking at stuff in his his rural estate. And bringing together all of that information let him see patterns in the natural world that enabled him to to write The Origin of Species and make an incredibly convincing case for the science of evolution. Collecting things is obviously an important thing. Uh, if you're going to be a scientist, or, or maybe it's one of the important things that might turn you into kind of a scientist. Uh, you quote in your book Ernest Rutherford, mm-hmm. who, <laughs> who famously said that uh, all science is either physics or it's stamp collecting. And Rutherford probably said that because he was a physicist and didn't uh, have a very high opinion of all the other kinds of science. But you, you've you distilled the processes of science down to four steps, including the process of collecting. Maybe you could tell us about your four-step method to science. So the the scientific reasoning process really boils down to, to four very general steps. Uh, the first is you just look at the world around you and see something that you want to explain. And then you think about why it might work the way that it does. Then you test that theory through experiments and further observations. And once you, you come to some conclusions about that, then you tell everybody you know the results of your tests and your, your model. And, and that four-step process is the most powerful tool we have for understanding how the universe works and uh, how to use that to our advantage. I think that some people might be, I don't know, saying to themselves, look, think, test, tell. You know, those are all things we do naturally. I I look both ways before crossing a street. I think about where I want to cross, and and then I cross and so forth. But, you know, they're not thinking, well, that's science. No, but I think that that's part of the problem is is we need to recognize that, you know, that sort of reasoning is something that comes very naturally to all of us. And it's not something that's alien or or especially difficult. You know, if you look as far back as we have evidence of, of humans doing stuff, we have evidence of people doing science. Right. You look at cave paintings and there are these, these wonderful pigment factories that they found in, in these caves in, in South America. 
right? That's evidence of somebody doing science. Somebody had to, to recognize that certain types of rock, if you grind them up, make these interesting colors. And somebody had to figure all that out, and the way they figured that out is by trial and error. So, you know, 100,000 years ago, our distant ancestors were thinking like scientists. But, Chad, couldn't I view this uh, approach as being a little bit condescending? Come on, I know I'm not really doing science. You can tell me that my day-to-day -day existence, you know, follows all the steps and so forth, but I would never regard that as science. I mean, isn't there some difference here between my daily life and science, assuming I'm not a scientist? Well, I, I think, you know, it's just a question of how you direct the tools that you have, right? And in some cases, you can go through life making decisions sort of on autopilot. But one of the things that I think is, is powerful about this is if you recognize that you can think like a scientist, you can take that and take a little more conscious control over, over things that you're doing unconsciously already and use that process to make your life better. You can look at the world and say, you know, this is a thing that doesn't work quite as well as it should. And think about, well, why is that? Why am I doing it that way? And think about other ways that you could do things and try stuff out. And, you know, if you find something that works better, then you can tell everybody that so that they can benefit from your knowledge as well. Can you give me an example of that? Uh, you know, simple sort of silly example of this is at, at one point I did an experiment checking how I drive to work, right? There's, there's a couple of different routes I would take. And so for a few weeks every day I would pick a route and I'd start a stopwatch when I got in the car and stop it when I got to my parking spot and see. And, you know, over time it worked out, okay, this is actually the most efficient way to do this, which is, you know, fantastically nerdy, but, but also, you know, worked pretty well, and I, I, I felt good about having solved that little problem. Well, finally, Chad, at the end of your book, you address a few myths about science. Some of those are uh, science is not exclusively Western. Science is not a cult. What do you say to people who uh, dispute either? Yeah, the, the notion of science being exclusively Western is a, a really sad misconception that, that gets floated, you know, tragically by some really bright people from time to time. Uh, but, you know, it, it's nonsense. I mean, scientific activity goes back long before anybody even heard the word Europe. And if you look around the world these days, science is a highly international business with people making contributions from all sorts of countries and all sorts of cultures. Um, some of the, the greatest developments in, in physics have come from people in China and India and Japan. So uh, it's, it's just silly to say that, that science is exclusively a Western thing. The other notion that ends up being problematic is that, you know, science is some sort of cult and that, you know, you, you sign on, you, you have to become like a, a Vulcan or some sort of robot. Um, you know, and that, that's, that's really not true, that, that science doesn't preclude other ways of thinking about the world or even, you know, come into things like aesthetics. You occasionally hear people say that, you know, well, you know, scientists, you know, they're, they're all about dissecting flowers, not appreciating the beauty of flowers. But, you know, knowing something about how stuff works can deepen your understanding of, of how things are. Chad Orzel, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me on. Chad Orzel is a physicist and an astronomer at Union College, and he is the author of How to Teach Physics to Your Dog and Eureka, Discovering Your Inner Scientist. Okay, so who knows? Your future could still be in science. At least your inner scientist has a future. But if you decide to actually go for the PhD, well, while there's no doubt that research is a fabulous career, truth in advertising requires that we tell you it's not always what it's cracked up to be. That's right. After using this entire program to sell you on being a scientist, we have to point out the pitfalls. And they come from some newly minted scientists whom the journal Science asked to name and describe a course that would have better prepared them for a scientific career. That is, describe a course that they wish they could have taken but didn't because it doesn't exist yet. My name is Mike Kemp. I'm a biochemist and molecular biologist at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So the course I would have liked to have had is BSF 101, grant writing. So the objective of the course would be to provide the students with the necessary skills to effectively market their scientific ideas to funding agencies and grant review panels. So this foundation course would, would be essential for people to survive as a scientist in the era of limited research funding. So topics would include things like 
developing professional connections, understanding reviewer psychology and bias, memorizing detailed and arcane grant instructions and guidelines. The course will be graded as pass-fail. However, only 10% of the students can pass during any eight term, and the course can be repeated indefinitely. Mike, I take it that you've had a lot of experience in writing grant proposals. Yes, especially ones that have not gone through. <laughs> Mike Kemp, thanks very much. Great, thanks. Hello, I'm Ilona Kotlewska from Warsaw. I'm a PhD student in neurobiology. So the course that I would have taken is the Communications 201. It is how to design catchy posters and write engaging articles. One of the fundamental aspects of scientific work is to present your research results. This may be a bit of a problem when it comes to poster designing. We all know those walls of text from scientific conferences. Well, PowerPoint presentations aren't easy either. Ever fell asleep while reading your own slides? And then those crazy difficult articles that give you a headache? Let's stop that. In this course, we will drill writing, designing, and presenting so that no one ever falls asleep again when confronted with your data. Ilona, why is it that you wish you had taken this course? Have you suffered in colloquia or at conferences? Well, I did. I did suffer in seminars, but more important was when I first had to design my poster for scientific conference. I had no clue how to do this. Uh, so I even searched for any introductory course in the YouTube, internet in general. Uh, so I thought if anybody could have taught me that before, it would be way easier for me. I'm Jonathan Lipsitz, and I wish I had taken a course on dealing with failure. Dealing with failure. Jonathan, why the heck would you want such a course? Well, in undergrad, we have this idea that scientists do experiments, and they work every time, and they discover all sorts of wonderful things. But in reality, experiments rarely work the first time and often require months or years of trial and error before you get the results that you're looking for. And this leads to a lot of people to become frustrated, depressed, and confused about why they are spending so much time on trying experiments that seem to repeat failures that they have encountered. And so I wish that there was a course where I was taught about how to deal with these setbacks, which were inevitable in my scientific career. And in such a course, I would hope to cover topics such as setting realistic goals, uh, learning how to build a supportive network of colleagues and mentors, figuring out how to really learn from my mistakes, making sure that I keep my end goal in mind, and to make sure that I have fun along the way. And that's a course that I wish I had taken in my scientific career. I'm Tony Lamorelli, and I wish I had had the chance to take Psychology 549. You probably won't save the world. Tony, tell me the uh, course syllabus for Psych 549. This class is designed to set realistic expectations for you in your career, allowing you to skip the disenchantment phase and focus instead on your talents. Through presentations and peer-to-peer -peer learning, you will learn that the world's problems are complex and require many, many dedicated scientists to tackle them, of which you will be only one. Learn how you can use your research or your teaching to improve and even transform the lives of people around you and begin to build the skills to be satisfied with that. Tony Lynn, I've got to ask you, I mean, most young people figure that they are going to change the world. Aren't you afraid that this may just uh, drive them to some sort of worthless alternative career like being a weight guesser at uh, Coney Island? Well, I am hoping that they read the description and not just the title, because I think that everybody can do their part to make a really big difference, but that we can do more together than we can trying to fly solo and do it all alone. Our thanks to Michael Kemp, Ilona Kotletsky, Jonathan Lipsitz, and Tony Lynn Morelli. And that's it for our show. And what we've heard so far is that everyone, to some degree, thinks like a scientist. And you may not change the world, but a few good ideas and sometimes just a lucky break will at least help us understand the world. Thanks to a production team who are always thinking clearly, even if we're not, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Also thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky-David and Sammy David and the NASA Astrobiology Institute. 
Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists investigate the nature and prevalence of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to Skeptic Check, your inner lab coat. Now that you're thinking like a scientist, you may crave more science. Well, you can find lots of it in past episodes of Big Picture Science, and those are found in our archive on our website, bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener, but you prefer to hear our show on over-the-air radio, because radio waves go through even the thickest lab coat, well, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. Oh, and have a comment, a criticism, or a suggestion? Well, you wouldn't be thinking like a scientist if you didn't. Toss in some praise and email the whole thing to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org. 